Hi, welcome to our JFCS Maternal Health Program. My name is Lauren Lipwitz. I'm a local realtor and a mom of two girls. I absolutely love our community and I'm so honored and excited to be here tonight. This topic especially excites me and it hits very close to home. I'm the mom of two girls, ages six and nine. Two girls. I absolutely love our <laughs> Sorry for that. That was a little bit of feedback. Um, and during normal times, I find being a parent very rewarding, but also very challenging. Um, so adding a pandemic takes this to a whole new level. I feel so lucky we're able to chat with Carly Kodish, a circle worker, social worker, and care manager for JFCS Philadelphia. Carly works primarily with the Orthodox Jewish community in Philadelphia. She focuses on individual and family services, as well as community focused on individual family programs. Carly facilitates the Bloom Outreach Program, which is a weekly supportive support group for parents with kids under five. It is absolutely incredible. I've heard the most incredible things about it. And luckily, she's also doing her classes on Zoom right now. And moderating tonight will be Debbie Bornstein, the Director of Donor and Event Operations for JFCS. So if you guys are ready, we can get started. Oh, let's do it. Oh, wait, and I just forgot, I just realized one thing, Carly, because <laughs> I just got excited. Carly also has two kids of her own, a five-year-old and a two-year-old, but a very fun fact is she's due with her third in about a week. No, not a week, but a month. <laughs> well, she's 36 weeks. Okay. And yeah. you, I guess I just have wishful thinking for you over here. I also have wishful thinking very, for another month. <laughs> I'm very excited. I keep thinking any day, but if anyone can relate to what we're all going through, I think it's Carly right now. Um, but shakes me into my next question. The first question. We're living in times where everyone is overextended, including our kids and especially our parents. Is it normal to bring out the worst in us? What can we do to help the damage? That's a really good question. Um, and I think every day kind of feels like we're fighting a different battle. You know, um, I, I'm, I'm meeting all of my clients now over Zoom and the majority of them are also moms with young kids at home. And, you know, we're all kind of feeling this camaraderie that we didn't feel when we were meeting in person. And I find myself asking them, you know, how, how are you doing, you know, other than everything that you're dealing with? You know, like, there's already just an understanding that their stress is the baseline that everybody's feeling. Um, and before we started this call, we were just talking about mom shaming. Um, and I think that this is such a relevant topic to bring up in this, in this question because there is so much judgment. I remember when all of this started, everybody was coming out with their like color-coded schedules. schedules. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, yes. And um, you know, there is definitely value in having some sort of routine established for you and your family. But I think the idea is to take the pressure off. You know, we are living in such uncertain times and all of the rules change for us and for our kids overnight. And you know, the majority, of families that are living with two incomes. Um, there, you know, there is, if people are trying to juggle working from home and homeschooling their kids, there's so many more responsibilities and the opportunities to turn it off and to find self-care are so few and far between. So the answer is yes, it can absolutely bring out the worst in us and it can bring out the worst in our kids as well. And it's really important to be patient with yourself and to meet yourself where you are every step of the process. Yeah, I mean, I can just go on sometimes social media and I, right away, within two minutes, I'm like, I can't even get my kids to sit for a Zoom read out loud by their teachers and people are building robots. Right. <laughs> so it's, it's all that pressure that you don't want it to, but it really does start to weigh on you and you really do feel like you're not enough. Right. So I love, I mean, sometimes it feels better for someone just to say to me, yes, you're right. It, through it. And it's I could, really I could tell you every single one of my clients has said to me through this whole process that they feel like a failure as a mom. And <laughs> Good. I, right. And right. Um, one of them actually told this really sweet story that she, her oldest son turned to her and said, but mom, we're all alive. Like you can't, right. you can't be a failure if we're all alive. And, you know, it seems so counterintuitive to hold that standard as like the standard that we need to hold ourselves to. But if your kids feel secure, if they feel safe, and safety means that they are expressing themselves. They might not be expressing themselves in the way that you're used to, and they might not be expressing themselves in the way that you want them to, um, especially, you know, toddler tantrums, teenage tantrums, um, everybody's talking about quarantine tantrums. I mean, that 
you can, I mean, you're taking the words and I just feel like everyone that is watching is like, yes, yes, yes. Um, even my dog is attached to me now. Yes, um, <laughs> mine too, I mean, actually. <laughs> like I, it's just becoming where the, I wake up with my five-year-old and I go to bed with my five-year-old. There's right. no time when we're, I mean, I don't know how she's ever going to go back to real life. Right. So, so I think the, the, piece about mitigating the damage. Um, yeah, I think you, owning, owning up when you make a mistake as a parent and you say to your kids, you know, mommy made a mistake or daddy made a mistake. Um, daddy and, made a mistake. yeah, you, you say, you know, I shouldn't have yelled, but I'm feeling really stressed. You're giving your kids tools that are really valuable. Children act out in frustration and also adults act out in frustration when we don't have words to verbalize how we feel internally. And so naming what you're feeling, even if it's after the fact, you are teaching your kids a really valuable coping skill that they'll be able to hold on to far after Corona is something that is affecting our everyday actions and behaviors. Um, I think also providing your kids with as much knowledge and empowerment and that, they, that you feel comfortable with about what the reality is on the outside. I know, uh, I know we're gonna be talking about that later. There's Nobody's another way that me. kids Kids can definitely feel more power and feel like they have more control over their lives because as much as we feel like our control was taken away from us, you know, no one asked, no one asked us, no one asked them. And I, I think it's really important for us to be able to remember and, you know, we meet ourselves every step of the way where we are and it's important for us to also meet our kids every step of the way where they are. So it's normal to be like a little honest with them sometimes? I think and, it's great. Okay, good. I, because sometimes yeah. I see my kids like, you know what? This really is hard. I'm yeah. having a day too. That is so like, validating for a five-year-old to hear. Am I, I'm like, am I being too honest? Am I, <laughs> you know, you get so, right. no handbook. Right. <laughs> They're the closest we have. Um, which brings me to my favorite, um, not my favorite topic, but something really important right now for any moms who are home with newborns or grieving the maternity leave that they were envisioning, or pregnant moms who are unsure or anxious about delivery. I mean, I can't even imagine what it must feel like for a new mom bringing their baby home in the middle of this pandemic. Um, what messages can we offer them? Are there any resources available for these women? Um, I know I, everyone's probably at a huge risk for perinatal depression and anxiety. So I, th I am really grateful for this question as someone who's personally experiencing a lot of it. I actually, um, I wanted to share a PowerPoint um, that I have pulled Great. up on my screen um, that I think will really speak to a lot of the, um, a lot of the moms that are in the situation that you're talking about. So let me just pull that. If I have a friend, what to say to them? Yeah, so I think the first thing is to first recognize that we are in, again, like no one's, people have done this before, a hundred years ago. People gave birth during the Spanish flu um, and they were, you know, in quarantine with their families. Oh, and now it's not. Oh, there we go. Okay, so I think going along with the same piece that we had before is giving yourself space to feel everything that you need to feel and recognizing that, you know, I'm they're reading all five and I'm yeah. like, yes. <laughs> so some of these even look ambitious to me, like throwing a pizza in the oven again for dinner. Like say, if yeah. the pizza came from the freezer, yes, then <laughs> I think that's great. Yeah, but I, right. I want to make sure that, you know, it's not, but locking yourself in the bathroom to have a break, even if that break is just to cry and then to, to come out and tell your, your kids, like, you know, I, sometimes mommy gets sad too. And I need to be able to feel what I'm feeling. I think that those messages are so important. And for moms that are going into hospitals, there's so much uncertainty um, in labor and delivery about the safety of the protocols, how many support people you're going to be able to have with you. If you're going to be able to have a support person with you, knowing where your rights are and being able to advocate for yourself in a hospital system, I think is something that's really important. Um, I am a big advocate of doulas, uh, labor coaches, and even most hospitals are not allowing labor coaches to attend labor physically but they can be available virtually as a resource for moms in labor to help them understand, you know, this is something you should push back with, with the doctor, with the medical team. This is something that 
you know, is they're being reasonable here. Um, and I think that that's something that's really important. So arming yourself with education and then realizing that, you know, the feelings are going to be changing on a daily basis, sometimes minute to minute. I mean, and, and it before you add a new mom to me was the hardest stage of parenting. Yeah. So to bring in a pandemic like this, just, and then what about grandparents? And I mean, I don't, I know like dealing with my parents, they don't think that they're in the danger zone. Right. I mean, and I think everyone that's a young mom right now, I call ourselves young, <laughs> is feeling that about their parents. They're like such a struggle. So for a new grandparent not to be able to hold or visit their grandchild, I think is a really... Right. So my recommendation for that is always to, you know, blame it on the doctors, ask the pediatrician, ask the OBGYN what the recommendations are as far as grandparents, uh, family contact. And then, you know, it takes the, it takes it being a personal decision that you're making and saying, you know, you're not acting safe enough and saying, this is the medical recommendation. This is what needs to be done in order to keep me and my child safe. Right. And um, I think that that's a, you know, rely on the people that you put together and be confident that the team that you put together has the best interest for you and your child and in their hearts. And that, you know, that's what they're speaking to when they're giving you that, the, that recommendation. That is great. That's really great advice. And then for all the, you know, big sisters and big brothers and then the older kids around what sort of behavior and emotional changes can we expect to see in our kids? Because yes. So this one's a big yeah. one. And I know we've been in this situation for about 12 weeks. Um, and I'm sure that some of the, the information I'm going to share with you is not new, um, but I'm happy to go over it again. Um, I want to, I'm going to come back to this slide. I want to bring up some resources the CDC actually has a whole amazing slew of worksheets for every developmental stage that, um, that talks about behavioral changes that we might see in children because of anxiety and, um, not, and access to knowledge from right. COVID-19. I, I don't know if my kid's being a brat or it's anxiety. I really don't. So, so I think that, you know, there are certain things that children have to be um, held accountable for, even if it's coming from a place of anxiety. And that's part of teaching your kids healthy coping mechanisms. Love that. So I think um, the, you know, the, the major changes that we see are regressions. So we see a lot of kids expressing a lot more clinginess, a lot more, um, you know, insecurity and anxiety. My five-year-old, when all of this started, was first coming home, you know, we would take a walk around the block. That was our only outing. And he would say, mommy, why are so many people wearing masks? And then all of a sudden the conversation shifts to mommy, that person's not wearing a mask. Um, and, you know, on the rare occasion that we're all in the car and <laughs> we stay in the car while, you know, my husband will run into the grocery store or something, you know, he'll, he'll say, mommy, we're going to stay in the car, right? We're not going anywhere. Um, so, you know, verbalizing a lot of that, those anxious feelings for kids, I think is really important. And it, it does, again, labeling the emotion behind the behavioral change can really empower kids to make better choices and take control over their own behaviors. So toilet regression, sleeping regressions, you mentioned your, your five-year-old goes to bed with you at night, you're waking up with him in the morning. I just can't, even if I, I have with her, to sorry. With her. And right. that, we've really gotten away from that. Right, right. So it's a very typical regression that you're going to see. Um, and, you know, a lot of this is not things that we can control. A lot of parents have the desire to protect their kids from the information that's out there, but it's filtering in because it's changed everything that they know about the life that they're living. That's actually a really good point because what I was thinking, no matter how much we try and shelter them from all the realities of what's going on, they're still getting these messages. No matter, I turn, I stop watching the news, but my kids still are like, we're never going to be able to go to the zoo again. So what do we do about things that when they pick up these messages about the virus and about safety, about things like going to museums and playgrounds, how can we frame this for our kids that makes them feel safe and empowered? So I think giving a develop, I'm just going to go back a couple of slides, giving yeah. a developmentally um, appropriate amount of information, depending on how, what developmental stage your children are in is definitely the correct way to handle. So you have um, to really look at it by age, you're saying? I think, you know, the way you would talk to a 15-year-old about personal responsibility and COVID-19 okay. and being careful in being, um, 
you know, being careful in their ability to get, uh, to stay socially distant is very different than how I might describe it to my five-year-old. Okay. Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, my five-year-old understands that there's some sort of elusive germ that's out there in the world and that we're doing all of these things and making all of these changes because we have to be safe. And the idea of that safety, um, I have no idea why this slideshow is just, it like has that. a mind of its and own. And there's such good information on, <laughs> on everyone to see it. Um, it will be uploaded in the comments yes. um, as a PDF. So everybody will okay. be able to see it. I just have no idea why it's my, my keyboard is not letting me, um, is not letting me select sure. the slides the, the way that I'm hoping it would. Um, but I, let me see if I can troubleshoot that also. I may be able to end my, um, my screen share um, and then go back. Let me see if I can. Okay. So, um, so I, I think that um, Fred Rogers is someone that I'm fascinated by. One of the Mr. most Rogers? amazing. Yeah. Mr. Rogers, <laughs> in Mr. Rogers neighborhood. Um, every single um, season is by the way, available on Amazon prime. If anybody is interested um, and if he is an amazing, he has an educational center called the Fred Rogers Center. And this is one of my favorite quotes from him, um, which is anything that's human is mentionable and anything that is mentionable can be more manageable. When we talk about our feelings, they become less overwhelming, less upsetting and less scary. So allowing your kids to be participants in the conversation instead of it being that they're just absorbing all of these messages like, oh, so-and-so can't come over for a play date because of the virus. That feels very helpless for a child. But saying, you know, we can do things like washing our hands. We can do things like wearing a mask if we have to go to a public or a crowded space. That's going to keep you safe. That's a way to help uh, children feel empowered and making decisions that they feel confident about in, in all of this. So um, I think the answer is to give your children as much information as you think they can handle and, okay. and combine that with concrete things that they can do to be able to take control over their peace and their actions and their behaviors in it. So it's okay to say to my nine-year-old, no, we can't go to so-and-so's house, but we, if we keep washing our hands and wearing masks and doing everything we can do, this will go away in the, and in the future. Yeah. And, you know, we will find a safe way for you to see your friends again, you right. know, making sure that they know this isn't going to last forever. Okay. Is it, I mean, sometimes I don't know. I'm like, is it okay to right. tell them that? Like, I don't know how much to promise them. I don't know where to. Right. Truth to tell them. It's like a hard. Right. So, you know, I mean, you know, your children best, so you know what your kids can handle better okay. than anybody else. And I would say that to every mom who's listening, that so you know your children best. That, that, right. Okay. Right. So, right, um, no mom shaming and trust yourself. Right. And, and also, you know, recognizing that we can't control everything. You know, one of my clients was saying it used to be that when she went to a funeral, her kids had no idea. They had no concept of what that was, but now all the funerals are on zoom. And so, you know, she's bringing it into her home. And that is a very, very difficult paradigm shift for us to make as adults, let alone for children to understand, oh, mommy's at a funeral, but she's in my living room. And what's a funeral? You know, so we're talking to our kids about these things. They're getting so many mixed messages. Um, and I think the most important piece is to give them space to talk about how the messages make them feel and to give them actionable things that they can do for themselves to take control of their own personal responsibility. Okay, and it's okay to tell our kids we don't know? Yeah, okay. I think it's the most honest thing that you can tell okay. your kids. Yeah. I just like to, you know, it's good to hear. So yeah. and this is, um, but one of my favorite topics, and it's gonna float into my other favorite topic, um, and anyone that's listening that knows me, how I feel about Zoom classes. <laughs> I'm sure you all saw some of those slides coming up. <laughs> I mean, it, there's just no words. And I just want to preface it that I think our teachers are amazing, but I, I give up. I can't do it. Um, it's really, I'm trying to work. My husband's trying to work. I have two kids running around the house. What can we do to make that easier for us? And if I can even bring it up, the uh, four-letter word of camp. Okay. So, well, let's start with school first. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, am I, I don't even know if I'm still screen sharing. Am I still screen sharing? 
Yeah. Okay. So, um, so I have this tweet from Shonda Rhimes that says, um, I've been homeschooling. Oh yeah. So been homeschooling a six-year-old and an eight-year-old for one hour and 11 minutes. Teachers deserve to make a billion dollars a year. I or, couldn't do it for that long. Or a week. Right. Right. So, um, I think what you said is a hundred percent correct. Our teachers are amazing. They are really putting in their heart and soul into getting these kids engaged into Zoom classes. I also think that they know from their professionalism and their training is that people are that you know that nothing is going to replace in person learning the way that the way that in person learning can handle you know teaching our children um, and I think that the message is you know there was actually Yale um, Yale Medical School published an article that said you know we want to let parents off the hook saying parents are not expected to work from home be you know be full-time parents be work be and work from home doesn't include parents that are normally working outside of the house it means also all of the homemaking responsibilities that fall on the parents that our kids usually aren't privy to 24 hours a day like all of the laundry and the dishes and wiping everything down seven thousand times because they're usually not home for three meals a day seven mm -hmm. days a week and um, I think that we can trust our schools and we can trust our teachers to be able to meet our children where they are. And if we're taking care of our kids emotional and you know, their social and emotional well-being by providing them safety to express themselves and by giving them you know, as much love as we can, as much time as we possibly can, which is really difficult under the circumstances. Oh, but it just warms my heart to hear you say that because it's really been such a, Every day, I mean, I, I get relieved on the weekends that I don't have to pull out that computer. It's yeah, I also find in my own house the transition from Sunday to Monday is a lot more difficult yes. without school because the the shift. You know, there's no such thing as homework anymore. Everything is homework because all of the schoolwork that kids are doing at home is homework to them. And you know, all of the teachers in the school districts know that the the rules change for children overnight. And I think that next year they're going to have to figure out a way, and I trust that they will figure out a way because they're amazing, to meet each kid where they are and to be able to create benchmarks to kind of make up for the material that was lost. And it might mean more tracking, you know, all of the standardized tests were pretty much canceled, I think, in almost every state unless they were done in the fall. Um, and so I think that it's, it's, we're, Everything is going to be one step at a time, and this is a learning experience for everyone, schools, teachers, parents, and children included. No, I just appreciate it so much because I, it's hands down the hardest um, struggle that I've had, and that leads me into the other, the other topic that yeah. I don't know if I should go there or not, and, but I feel like we couldn't talk about parenting without bringing it up. Yeah. So um, we're in Pennsylvania. I don't know how many viewers we have from out of state. Um, and we are in the Philadelphia region. And the governor announced last week that starting June 5th, we're going to be moving to our yellow phase of reopening the state. For those of you who don't know, that means that a lot of day camps that... No matter how many times I watch the news, I don't know. So Yes. <laughs> so. Um, a lot of day camps that were anticipated to be closed for the summer will be open. Um, and a lot of people are expressing a lot of uncertainty about personal comfort in having their children go back to a day camp, uh, a day camp situation. Some overnight camps I've also heard are still on the fence about opening and they haven't made an announcement, but they're going to wait and see. Um, and I think, you know, I actually just read a great article today from parents.org or parents.com. Um, that said every family has to be in charge of, again, creating their own boundaries and their own rules um, in what they're comfortable with. You know, we can understand from a public health perspective and a financial health perspective, socioeconomically, why the state would be making the decision to reopen. But we're talking about measuring personal risk right now. And there's no magic equation for that. That's something that every family is going to have to determine on their own. And it, it goes, again, I know it's hard to not have the answers. No, it's, it's so comforting to hear that. What I do might not be the same as what my best friend decides to do. And we right. have to support each other. And it's right. it was back to the mom shaming and the guilt. And it's just the age old, every family's different. Right. Well, what's best for your kids might not be what's best for your sister's kids or your best yeah. friend's kids or your neighbors and down I, the street's kids. That's yeah. something I know me personally, I have to remember that it only matters what's best for my right. family. And I really appreciate that. Right. 
So I can talk about that all night again. So thank yeah. You. <laughs> well, I'm glad. I'm glad it's a little heartening. I think also I remembering that it's okay to change your mind. You know, if you send your kids to camp and then something happens and you need to bring your kids home, like that, everybody's going to understand because this is again new to all of us, and the rules are constantly changing. The guidelines are constantly changing. And camp might not be what your kids envision it to be. So, you know, like if they have to wear a mask all the time, they might not want to go. And, you know, that'll be a different personal decision that you have to make versus another family where the kids don't care about wearing masks. And, you know, they're just thrilled to be with their friends. So I think, again, you know your kids best and you know your family best. And whatever you decide to do will be what's best for you and your family. And I could not agree with that more. I love that. I thank you that really that really Deb did we cover all the questions or do we have I actually have some viewer questions Yay. great so um and we have amazing people tuning in tonight so this is really fantastic Thanks, so um one question that I had is to get your perspective on what do you think this pandemic is going to the impact it's going to have short term and potentially long term on our children which is a very big question, I know. But Oh, wow, that is a humongous question. Um, and I could probably do a whole another Facebook Live on just this one question. Um, so I think that um, short term, we're seeing we're living the impact right now. We're seeing how our kids are being affected by having less play dates. We're seeing, you know, there's probably more conflict in your house if it looks like mine with my children fighting and screaming, but then, right. But I, I mean, know. sometimes there's also really beautiful moments where they're both getting along so well. And I'm like, oh, maybe we do have this thing figured out for the three minutes that they get along so well until one pulls up the other one's hair, you know, whatever happens. Um, and then I, I, we are living the short-term impact right now. Kids are incredibly, incredibly resilient. And if childhood development has agreed about anything from a, psycho, a psychological history of childhood development, it is that fact, that children are incredibly resilient. So, you know, just like our kids were able to learn all of the new rules, figure out how to get homeschooled at home, figure out how to navigate being home with all of their siblings, all of their family members, not seeing grandparents, not seeing friends, not seeing aunts and uncles, they will be able to relearn how to go back into school and back into their social circles and remake friends and make new friends. And I think as long as we are providing our children the security and the secure base to be able to explore how they feel throughout the process, there aren't going to be long-term traumatic effects for our children. If you have a concern that your child is facing an excess amount of anxiety or is facing an excess amount of you know, if they're showing signs of depression, if they're verbalizing um, depressive thoughts, or if they're talking about wanting to hurt themselves or end their own lives, you know, get help immediately. Um, I would say any sort of mental health supports that you can put in place for your children right now, you will be very grateful for as, there, as things continue to evolve over time, if, you're, if you feel like your children are being extra affected by all of this. I mean, I couldn't have dreamt of a better answer. Right? Amazing. So, Amazing. I mean, <laughs> great, because we all, I mean, I am so worried about the long-term effects and just, to, and to not hear, well, they're not going to their Zoom classes, so they're really going to, you know, they're going to be behind is very comforting, so thank you. Yeah, one, one comment we have is actually from a teacher who says, being a teacher and a mom has yeah. been a very challenging and that their struggle is real. And they worry not only about their own kids, but also their extended kids. Like, yeah. how is it going to be in the fall and, you know, and that sort of thing. So, um, but we're getting such positive feedback in the comments. It's really wonderful. Um, how can a brand new mom connect with other new moms who are going through the same thing? Um, well, they could attend our Zoom uh, Bloom Mom Chats, which are on Monday mornings every week from 11 to 12. Um, we have a, a combination of both self-care and parenting bonding activities with kids. We've done Mommy and Me Yoga over Zoom, which is super fun. We've done, um, we have a, a great art therapist at JFCS who's done art therapy with moms and kids. Um, of, my two-year-old was able to participate, which was amazing. It was such an easy art project and she loved it. She felt so special and cared for. Um, we have this uh, ne next week on Monday, we're doing a uh, meal prep seminar with our amazing chef at JFCS, Drew Gold. 
She's going to be talking about how to simplify meal prep since we're at home for, again, three meals a day, seven days a week with our children, and also how to safely engage them in the kitchen. Um, and then we also have you know, just support. You, if you want to vent about how hard this is for you, we talk about mindfulness tips. We talk about how to help your kids when they're having, uh, you know, a temper tantrum, how to help yourself when you're having a temper tantrum. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's a great way to connect with other moms who are going through the same thing. Um, there's also great resources at the Postpartum Stress Center, which is a wonderful organization that we've partnered with at JFCS. Mm -hmm. And they have virtual support groups, I think two or three days a week. And the link for that is in the slideshow, which will be posted in the comments. Yeah, I already, I posted it when you posted oh, it. Great. Awesome. Up, just in case. That's, that is incredible. But there, the resources are definitely out there, which is wonderful. The, I feel like the mental health community has really made such an effort to make resources um, accessible. So that's really great. Um, the last question I have is what is the one thing or might be more than one thing that you want to tell all the moms out there? Like what are the things to just remember? I would say that the message, and I don't hesitate in this because I think that it's a message that all moms need to hear. If I could get like a, a t-shirt or something like inside the yeah, lenses of my glasses, right? <laughs> something that I could constantly look at. I think the message is that you're doing, you're doing it enough. Like there's this idea in, um, in attachment theory about the good enough mother. She's not the perfect mother. She's good enough. That means she knows what her kids need. She's able to meet them where they are. She's able to meet herself where they are. And it, every growing pain that parents have with their children, every it's called in, in the psychological terms, it's called a rupture when, you know, when there's a, a disconnect between a child and a parent there is always a repair. And as long as that cycle is complete where you have a rupture and then a repair and then another rupture and then a repair, you're doing it enough. And I think that if there's anything that moms can take away from this is that you're doing, if your kids are, if your kids are safe, if they're fed, if their, their basic needs are met and they feel safe and secure and they're expressing themselves to you, you're doing it enough. I'm getting a t-shirt. <laughs> I mean, those five words, if, if we really, because it's something that I need to hear every day, and I hope I'm a good enough mom. Yeah, I was gonna good say, enough. yeah, I'm streaming, and we are all good enough. I'm yeah, all good enough. we are all good enough. <laughs> yes, yeah, Give me a project tomorrow. Um, that was incredible. Great way to end. Carly. Great, thank you. I don't have any more questions, it's a lot of really positive feedback. Um, really and happy. the viewership has been really wonderful tonight. So, Great. all right, well, thanks everybody for thank joining. You. Thank you, thank you. See everyone. Thank you, thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Carly. This has been really fantastic. Okay, so thank fun. you. Oh, I think Lauren left. <laughs>